Praise God. I've discovered over the years that the words that my wife gets are accurate. They're always edifying. There's always they always build up and they always declare the intention of the Lord in our response in our response and always very accurate. So I'm blessed. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dee. <clears throat> You know, if there's, uh, if there's two things, I think, that would define the, the, uh, the mission of the God of this world, that religious system and all, over the last 2,000 years, and even prior to that, certainly, going back actually to the, to the exit from the garden, would be, you know, the, the, his work to, to um, what do I want to say, corrupt man's revelation of the true nature of God. And then certainly his work to distance you from any real concept of your true identity. And, you know, those are the two things. Those are really the two things that I believe the ministry of Jesus was, was all about, was restoring our, our understanding, our revelation uh, of, of the Father, and, and also of revealing to us who we really are, reclaiming our identity. Not that we really ever lost that identity, but as we've been talking about so much, you lost the knowledge of that identity. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I've realized over the years is that, uh, how many, I mean, we all know what amnesia is, right? And the word amnesia literally means to lose the memory. That's what the word means. And as I looked out over the body of Christ, you know, as I said, Marilyn and I have been pastoring since 1978, and as I looked out over the body of Christ, I uh, over the years, I realized that the church was comprised mostly of amnesiacs. People who just didn't know who they were. And you know, an amnesiac, I don't know if that's a good word, but I've made it, so we're going to use it. An amnesiac, and this is the, one of the mo- most important things we can get about that, you know, the amnesiac is who he is in spite of his perceived reality. Isn't that right? I mean, that's, he is who he is in spite of what he, what he can remember about himself or what he thinks about himself, you know. And the, the job of the caretakers, the job of those who are ministering to uh, folks with amnesia is to do what? Is to present them with every possible, you know, picture, letter, smell, you know, uh, take them out on 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 on, on opportunity, you know, trips, whatever, to 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 reassociate their memory with who they are, to bring them back into the realization, so that they can begin to look at that picture of that beautiful woman and there's th- and those three or four children, and not say, I have no clue. And the the caretaker says, This is your wife. These are your children. And uh, and they don't know that. They don't realize that. And so the caretaker, and many times the caretaker is a family member, maybe it is the wife, maybe it is the children, maybe they're all participating, but the caretaker's responsibility is to begin to do those kind of things. Read letters from the family, read letters from the husband, from the wife, from the children, things that might jog a memory, isn't that right? And you know, years ago I began to see that my job, what God had called me to do, was to be a caretaker of the amnesiacs. You know, I mean, begin to, just to do whatever I could do, present whatever I can present from the Scripture, you know, read letters from, from your father and your brother to you, and, and, and communicate the pictures uh, of their experience with you and your experience with them until they would, it would begin to click, until things would begin to come together and people could find, finally say, that's me, that's me, you know. So anyway, I'm going to just do a little bit of that today, if you don't mind, and I'd like if you'd go with me over to Genesis chapter 17, and uh, we're going to look at a few things. I don't believe this will be a real long message because y'all have had a really long, long time here already. And and uh, as Francois said, you know, the mind begins to be overflowing, but deep within us, I find all the time, you know, that I go through, listen to ministry, listen to a CD quickly, you know, listen to two or three CDs, read somebody's book. And my mind can't tell you anything anymore after a certain period of time. I'm, I can't remember what I read. But I'll find myself up preaching and then I'll, I will exactly quote somebody. And I will remember who I heard it from and where I heard it. And I didn't even, you know. And, and so I find that just comes right up out of your spirit at times. So I believe that, you know, I have something to offer you today that will be helpful. Uh, right along with all of the rest of it. 
Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Ab- your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Now we see here, and we understand here that uh, that Abraham is in a, is in a place of identity crisis. He's in a place where he is going to lose a, lose an identity that he's been oh so familiar with for so very long. And he's going to be taking on a new identity. Now, even though in our English language, both of these seem to be somewhat similar, you know, it's like almost like Mike and Michael in the way we would read it, Abram to Abraham. But, you know, there's something much bigger than that going on here. And, uh, and, and I want you to see that th- this whole thing, and I want you to try to, as we go through here, I want you to... Uh, Try to apply this to everything you've already learned, everything you've already heard about the wonderful thing that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have already done in you, to you, and through you. See, and I, you know, I love this thing that Baxter introduced me to in his book, you know, that it's not so much, I mean it is, but it's not, the, the, the best wording is not always what Jesus has done for you, but it's what he's done to you. And that is such a powerful statement. That has had such an impact on my life for a couple of years now, but... Anyway, now notice that he says here, and we're going to just go back and forth in this a little bit. First of all, with this this part in verse 4 where he says, You shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. So as the identity uh, crisis comes to its uh, its peak here, we realize that, that, that there's something, in, something required. He said, you shall be, for I have made. Now, I see in this a, an opportunity for us to understand the experience of our salvation in light of what's been, what's been already been accomplished. He's already done it. You shall be, for I have made. And I want to, when you hear those words, I have made, does that do more than just uh, communicate to you? That something that he's done, does it also maybe communicate, can you hear in that, that he is the substance of what he's made? For I have made. In other words, I have become, in a sense. You know, I have made. It's not just what I've done, but I've not only done it, but I am it. You know what I'm saying? So, but he's talking to Abraham here, to Abram, and he says, You shall be a father of many nations, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Can you hear in that 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 the that the you shall be that the you shall be is built upon the name change? You're going to experience this is going to become your reality, your experienced reality, see, as you enter into the understanding of the identity that I have for you and not the identity that your father gave you 99 years ago, your earthly father. Now, here's the thing I pondered on, you know, at one time. I said, you know, it started out, the reason I started in verse 1, because it says, when Abram was 99 years old. And if God had, what, what if when God came to Abram with this beautiful transition, what if when God came to him, he said, well, you know, Boy, this is just a wonderful, wonderful thing you're speaking to me, Father. You know, but I think what I'm going to do, I've been been Abram for 99 years, and it's going to be really difficult to change my name. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to walk (laughs) in the name of my old identity, but I'm going to believe you to be the father of many nations anyway. He'd still be childless today. Because, you see, the blessing is in the identity that the Father has given us. Isn't that right? The, 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 the expression of God's blood, blood is in that. You see what I'm saying? So he didn't have the, the, really the uh, opportunity to do that. You know, he had to make a decision right here and now. Am I going to begin to, from now on when I go to the marketplace and I, and, I, and I stick out my hand and I introduce myself to someone, and now when I introduce myself, I, I'm, I'm going to say, good morning, I am the father of many nations. 
because that's what Abraham means. So now he's making that he's making that confession, he's making that expression, he's declaring himself to be what God said he already was. He's doing that every time he goes to the market, isn't he? Every time somebody passes through his camp and they say, we want to speak to the leader, to the tribal leader, and they bring him to his tent and they bring him into the tent, bring somebody into the tent, and he stands up from behind his whatever kind of desk he had in those days, and he sticks out his hand and he says, welcome to my family, welcome to my tribe, I am the father of many nations. See? He's now taken on a whole new projection of who he is. For many years, he was just Abram. But now he's making a declaration whom the Father said he was. Isn't that right? Now, we look at this a little more. It says here, <clears throat> backing up in the beginning of verse 4, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. Now, the word shall is different than the word will. The word shall is a word that actually communicates obligation. In other words, here's what he's saying. And this got, in the, when I first saw this, it was a bit confusing until I saw something a little further. Here's what he's really saying. He said, you are obligated to become the father of many nations. No longer... Uh, no longer is your name obligated to be called Abraham, but your name is now obligated... <laughs> to become Abraham, I mean Abram rather. See, there's a, he, he's communicating an obligation, an obligation that is necessarily going to have to be fulfilled in order for the blessing to become the experience of his life. I read that and I thought, well, that's wrong because I've been preaching for years that we have been saved beyond obligation. See, whom the Son is set free, free, exempt, whom the Son is made exempt, from moral, ceremonial, and mortal liability or obligation is free indeed. See, I've been preaching that for a long time. And so when I ran across this word that communicated obligation, that there was an obligation, I thought that the obligation was upon Abraham's part until the Lord backed me up into the first part of that verse where God says, as for me. And what did he say then? As for me, my covenant is with you. Who is the covenant? Jesus. Isn't that right? He said, as for me, my covenant is with you. See? Now that gives a whole different picture to the obligation that's being communicated here. Really what he's saying is, the obligation is all mine. The Father's taken that obligation upon Himself. As for me, my covenant, as for me, this is my part, my covenant is going to be, you know, is with you, and therefore you shall be, for I have made. Isn't that right? But now, you're not going to experience this multiple, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. You're not going to experience, though, that as long as you continue to embrace Abram, you're going to have to begin to agree with me. You're going to have to become, as Caleb was saying in church a couple of weeks ago, you know, you're going to have to begin to say, uh-huh, to my plan, you know. You're going to have to begin to say, uh-huh, I agree with that. My name is the father of many nations because that's what you've declared to be true of me. See? All right. Now, you don't need to go back there right now, but, you know, over in Romans, in the fourth chapter and the 17th verse, you know, in, in his, uh, Paul, Paul quotes this last part, uh, you, you, uh, who, the father of many, you, I have made you the father of many nations. He quotes that over there. And uh, I was, it was interesting because uh, this also goes along with what, you know, the, helping me understand the obligation situation. <clears throat> and my covenant is with you. I was reading that at one time and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to look up that word made. Well, that particular word that's translated made there in Romans 4.17 is a word that means to place in a horizontal and passive position. Now think about that. What's he saying? He's saying... And it says, as opposed to a vertical, an upright and aggressive and active position. Well, think what that means. He's saying, as you rest, my covenant will fulfill in you. You see, I've placed you. I have made you the father of many nations. I have placed you in a horizontal, that's Betty by time, see, an inactive or passive position. Isn't that interesting? He said, I, as for me, my covenant is with you. 
and that has placed you in a position of rest to just be the recipient of what I'm about to do as you rest and declare yourself to be who I've said you've been, who, who I say you are. You get that? So that also helped me understand that the obligation was not Abraham's. The obligation was being taken fully upon by the Father and his covenant. That's where the obligation was. He said, I'm obligated to you. You're not obligated to me. I mean, we've heard that in so many different word forms this week, that he, made, that he took upon himself all the obligation to recover our identity. He took all, upon himself all the obligation to recover everything of our origin, everything of our reality. Isn't that right? And so, in fact, Abram had, was, was made to be the father of many nations when? From before the foundation of the world. He said, I've made you the father of many nations before the foundation of the world. He already knew who Abraham was going to be, didn't he? He said, now you shall be, you shall experience what I have made you to be. But there's going to have to be some agreement with me. And you see what I'm saying? Now go on down to verse 17. Verse 15, I'm sorry, of chapter 17. Then God said to Abraham... See, now he's already, he's accepted his, his new name. He's accepted his true identity. Genesis chapter 17, verse 15. Then God said to the father of many nations, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her. Now, if you read that all quickly together, you realize what he's saying. Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her. Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her. See, once again... He's declaring that when you agree with the identity that I have in my mind for your wife, then there will be, when she agrees with it, then there will be a manifestation of that which has been spoken of the Lord, by the Lord. You get that? So I just kind of read that all together. Sarah shall be her name and I will bless her. Sarah should be in here, shouldn't she, Abigail? Go out there and tell her I'm preaching about her. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> And then we go on down to verse 19, and now, and now they're going to start this thing off right. Then God said, no, Sarah, shall, your wife, shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. So now here, you see, we've got a whole new start, a whole new, a whole new tradition beginning to develop. Now we're going to see that it didn't continue long enough, but we have a whole new tradition. So we have these two people who both had an, an identity crisis, who both had an identity encounter with God, you see, as he began to declare into the earth, you know, now it's my identity that you want to accept. It's my identity that you want to take upon yourself and begin to declare. Now, no longer, you see, what, really what I want you to do now, and of course, you know, the Hebrew people, still, the, Greek, the Jewish people still do this today. They, they still put some stock in what they name their kids, don't they? They don't just throw names out there like, like us Western, you know, culture people do. They don't just pick a name out of a hat, you know. And, and we're going to see how that can be very harmful here in just a moment, of course. But, but so these two had been named by their earthly parents, you know. But now God has an identity for them that he wants them to begin to enter into and experience the fruit and the benefit of. But now once he's got these two understanding this concept, this principle, then he's, he says, now, I'm going to name your children from here on out. I'm going to declare. Say, come to me and I'll give you the names. Right? I mean, we see this repeated all through Scripture. Most importantly, what? His name shall be called Jesus, right? We say, that's the most important one we see, but all through here, all right? Now, <clears throat> I want you to go with me over to Genesis chapter 25 now. Now, Isaac got off to a good start, but we're going to see that things got a little bit out of hand right away in his first generation. <laughs> Verse 21 of Genesis chapter 25. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord <clears throat> for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. She did the right thing, didn't she? She starts off doing the right thing. She's having a struggle. She doesn't know what's going on. I'm going to go talk to the Lord about this. She didn't say, I'm going to go to go talk to the neighbor lady and see if she's ever had this experience. 
She said, I'm going to go talk to the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to go. I mean, she did a wise thing, right? I'm just emphasizing that because I wish she'd have continued that way. Of course, if she had, I wouldn't have this next portion of the message to teach. So, yeah, I'm kind of glad she screwed up. But anyway, so she went to inquire the Lord, and the Lord said to her, so he's talking to her, two nations are in your womb, two peoples shall be separated from your body, one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, let me ask you something. This is God's promise. This is God's response to her question, to her coming to the Lord. You know. So now, if God gave a promise, if God made a declaration, do you suppose that God had a plan to make this come to pass? I mean, now, you've got to keep in mind, <clears throat> the older shall serve the younger was in total disregard of their cultural... You know what I'm saying? The workings of their culture. The older didn't serve. I mean, the, you know, the older didn't serve the younger. So already, you see, he's going against the grain, isn't he? God's going against the grain here. And there are so many types in this. Older shall serve the younger. I mean, so there's a, some double, triple types in here. But Jesus, you know, and and so on and so forth. You know, a, a, Adam falling subservient to, to to Jesus in this, and and us falling under the under the, uh, the the service of Jesus and, and so on. There's, but but I don't want to get into that now because I'm not even thinking about it accurately at the moment. But anyway, the point is that I believe that God had a means or had, had a plan for fulfilling this promise. When he spoke to her, I mean, I think it was, it, it was just absolutely in his heart to go on a, a little bit further. I think the father would have had her say, you know, Rebecca say, but now, Lord, how will that be? How can that be? That is not the way it is in our culture. Don't you understand the way our society works? See, the older gets the birthright and the blessing, not the younger. It cannot be. But see, she didn't listen. She didn't go any further. She didn't ask further questions. I'm, I ask a lot of questions. I ask a lot of questions, and I do a lot of listening. Right? All right, so... <laughs> When her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. Well, that's what God told her there would be. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother, the younger, came out. And his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Now, again, let me just kind of read this together so that you get what, ha what happened here. His hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called. You see the connection between his hand taking hold of Esau's heel and the name he was given? Because, you could read it this way, because his hand took hold of Esau's heel, his name was called Jacob. Right? Now, Jacob's an interesting word. Jacob's name means one who takes the place of another through scheming, treachery, and underhanded means. Does that sound like the name God would give a young man? <laughs> Think about it. See, now, if, if Sarah had, or I mean Rebecca, uh, up between 23 and 24, in that little bit of white space that exists on the page of my Bible, if she has, had said, what shall his name be, Lord? We'd have never had a Jacob. See? We'd have never had a Jacob. And isn't it interesting that down through the ages, Israel, who likes to attach to their antiquity, continued that name many times. Kept popping up. Even with the history of what this man's name meant to them, they kept reusing it. See? Charlie Manson, Charlie Manson, Charlie Manson, Charlie Manson. Nobody would do that. If your last name's Manson, you're not going to name your kid Charlie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Bad history with Charlie. <laughs> anyway, probably, no, I won't say that. But anyway, but, but I want you to see the connection. So, so here she has this promise from God, this word from the Lord. There's two nations in your womb. There's two people, twins, that are going to be separated from your body. One people is going to be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. So already her mind is thinking. As I said, she didn't ask another question. Her mind began to think. How can that be? And she began to devise a plan. 
She began to devise a plan that began right here with this right here. I mean, it began, she said, his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and because of that, his name was called Jacob. So mother identified him as one. Now listen to me. This, is going, this has to be going on in mom's mind. She gave him a name that identified him. She said, because he grabbed his brother's heel, this is a fulfillment of the word that the Lord gave me. This is one who will take the place of his brother through scheming, treachery, and underhanded means, and I'm his mother, and by God, I'll help him. <laughs> really? It's the only way it's going to happen. Isaac's not going to let culture be overthrown. He's not going to let the whole basis of their society be just turned upside down. He's, not, he's going to say, woman, submit. <laughs> and it's going to have about as much effect as it does in my house. <laughs> but you see, so I want you to get this little bit of history first because, you know, from this history now, we go over to chapter 32. But I want to also say about that what we saw there, so his name was called Jacob. Because, and again, I want us to keep trying to remember to relate this to, I don't, I, you know, I want to go too fast. I know you all have been here a long time, and I don't want to go too fast, but I want to go fast enough that we don't go to sleep, okay? Me included. <laughs> but, but I want you to see that what happened there, too, is that it, 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 I won't say it set a precedent, but it, uh, because it, it probably didn't. But, but once again, behavior defined identity. Is that right? Right? The behavior of the second one coming out, grabbing his brother's heel and so on and so forth, that defined his identity. That was the, the name that was given to him was based on what he did, right? Do we do that today? Nah, not me, right? We do that to ourselves as, as well as we do it to others and we allow others to do it to us. We allow religion to do it to us. Religion has done that to us. Religion has continued to call us Adamic, they've continued to call us sinners. They've continued to say, you know, some of the some horrible things, and we've agreed with it. We've sat in church and said amen. You know? And because we've become a bunch of bobblehead dolls. You know? When Caleb started recording his last CD... My, my little grandson, who's 11 years old, lives with us right now, and, and Marilyn was telling him about Uncle Caleb was recording another CD, and Noah said, was it Noah that said that? Yeah. Perhaps they'll make a bobblehead doll out of him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious. <laughs> well, perhaps China will make a bobblehead doll out of him. <laughs> you know, we had... I used to do an afternoon, Sunday afternoon message, uh, ministry time, for uh, sex offenders, the men and women who couldn't be in regular around, other, around children and with other adults because they were sex offenders, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I, would, I would minister for about four or five weeks, and then the, the group I was working with would, would have another pastor come in just for one Sunday to give me a Sunday off of my family in the afternoons. And So I would go preach on Sunday mornings at our church, and I'd go grab a sandwich, and then I'd go back and work. And I'd come in, and I had been ministering to these guys just we, and, and girls just week after week after week, you know, and, and they're all sitting there, and I'm sure they're getting it because they're all saying, <laughs> Amen, Amen, Amen. And then I got a week off, and the lady that was running the actual prison ministry aspect of that, she uh, sent a pastor over from the local spirit-filled Foursquare church, you know. And, well, it turned out that Marilyn was out of town or something that Sunday, so I went and got myself a nice lunch and came back and just thought, I'll just go sit there anyway because these people were people that I was pastoring. I was interested in what they were, how they were doing. And I fully expected this man to preach a message that was worth hearing. And he just spent an hour and ten minutes or something. I know it wasn't his intention, but undoing everything I'd been teaching for the last... Se- and as they sat there, <laughs> amen. Next week I got up in front of them and I just said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, there's a time when you need to learn to say amen and there's a time when you need to learn to say hell no. And you need to learn to say hell no out loud enough for the preacher to hear you once in a while. And that's the way I feel about it, you know. 
stop you from just bobbing your heads and saying amen. Because it's like I, it was Francois or, or, or Andre one said that the amen is where it begins, not where it ends. Isn't that right? Why begin a new? Why do? Why? Why begin your life with a faulty amen? Why begin? Why begin the next several months, years, whatever of your experience with a faulty amen? So be it unto me, Lord. What I'm saying. Well, I don't know why I got off on that, but but anyway, <laughs> mostly because I just wanted to t- talk nasty in church. <laughs> Listen. Abigail, at least I'm not standing up here in front of a young, unmarried woman talking about relationships with my wife like some of these men have done. <laughs> you too, Brittany. <laughs> no, it's okay, though. For, you know. <laughs> they may be afraid to get married. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But as I was saying, you know, but 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 we have been so. I did. We've done a lot of work in prison ministry too, as as well as pastoring the church, and uh, Caleb and I in Maryland, all three. And and you know, men and women that are that are confined, they have been so identified by their deed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And 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 but you know, people, men and women that have been confined in the religious system have just as well been identified by their deeds. Yeah. And and we we need to come out. We need, to, we need to recognize that from now on we recognize no man according to the flesh. We identify no man according to the flesh. We regard no man according to the flesh, right? But let's go on and let's look over here in Genesis chapter 32. Uh, verse 24, then Jacob was left alone. Let me, let me, put, let me put a little more of a feel into this. Then, then one who takes the place of another through scheming, treachery, and underhanded means, was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. <clears throat> and he said, this, this good, and God said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, How many times have we had a methodology that we will not let go until he blesses us? Right? That we will attack the heavens, that we will fast, that we will abstain, that we will do whatever methodology has been presented to us, but we're not going to let go until he blesses us, right? Okay. Well, let's look at this. Jacob said, I will not let you go till you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, one who takes the place of another through scheming, treachery, and underhanded means. <laughs> now, look at this. This is the first thing we need to realize here. He said, I will not let, let you go and let you bless me. So he said, what's that tell us? God wanted to bless Jacob, didn't he? Because he wanted to bless him. He's going to respond. He said, you're not going to let me go till I bless you? Okay, that's what I have in mind too. That's what I want to do. I want to bless you more than you want me to bless you, brother, son. I mean, I I want to bless you more than you want me to bless you. Okay? So what's your name? What's your identity? Well, and he proudly says, quickly, look how quick it was. In just a few keystrokes. (laughs) What is your name? He said, one who takes the place of another through scheming, treachery, and underhanded me. And he said, your name shall no longer be called one who takes the place of another through scheming, treachery, and underhanded means, but Israel, one who rules as God. Now think about this. Not who rule, one who rules as God as, as the elitist five-fold ministry in the church has tried to do over their congregations, rule over, but one who rules As God, one who governs, one who rules the situations as God would rule, who compassionately governs. See, if if his trust had been in this one who rules, if this had been his name, see, there was God's plan that he could have given to Rebecca in that little space that I have in my Bible between 23 and 24 over there. Had she asked, what shall his name be that will fulfill this? The older shall serve the younger. 
Because you see, one who rules as God understands how to compassionately make the switch and be a blessing to both of them, not such a struggle that it would communicate war clear down into our generation. Is that right? He said, your name shall be one who rules as God. Isn't that awesome? You think about it? So now, his identity crisis is being resolved. And we know that going forward, now we still see the references, and I I can't explain them. One of these fellows probably knows better than I do, but I can't explain it why Jacob continued to be an active name throughout the Old Testament. We see Israel and Jacob back and forth a lot, you know, and uh, I, I don't know. I've never really taken the time to study why it kept coming up. But anyway, but he goes on, he says, Your name shall be called, no longer be called Jacob, but one who rules is God, for you have struggled with with God and with men and have prevailed. I see in that, and there are probably a lot of other things to be seen too, but I'm seeing and know that God is saying, for you have struggled with your identity between God and man. You've struggled with trying to come to grips with who you really are. You've been trying to find yourself. See, you're between the promise that I gave your mother... See? And the experience that you've had because of your mother's treachery combined with your treachery and the deception of your father, you're struggling between the man way and the God way of resolving things. God, there must be. I can hear him crying out in his heart. God, there must have been a better way. My mother told me this was the word you gave her. She spoke to me and she said, Son, I went to your, I went to the Lord. I went to our Lord and I spoke to him and I said, There's something going on in my belly. What's going on? And he told me this and he said, Esau would serve you. But all he's got is problems. All he's got is all of this strife between him and Esau. All of these things going on. <clears throat> he's got to be saying, God, there must have been a better way. That was your word to mom. Did you ordain all this trouble I've been experiencing? Are you the author of all this hardship in my life? You must be because I'm following your plan according to my mom. Right? Can you hear that? I mean, we do that kind of stuff. This must be your hardship. Are you the author of this hardship? How many Christians have declared that? Right? And yet, where is the answer? In a name change. In a name change, in realizing how that comes about. And who rules is God? Jesus rules as God now, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, I want to take this on over now if you'll let me. I just wanted to give you a few. And we could go on and on and on. I've got a couple of series that I did on uh, identity, identity theft and identity restored. The long series. But I just picked a little bit of something there because what I want to do, uh, <clears throat> I want you to go with me over to Galatians chapter 3, first of all. And we're going to, first of all, look at that passage of Scripture in verse 16 that uh, Francois looked at the other day with us. Just because we want to understand, once again, the connection here. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and your seed who is Christ. Right? Right? So this is one of the things that I say to people that come to me who have been believing God for stuff, as Bertie said, believing for healing or for this or for that. And they come to me and they say, Pastor Mike, I've been standing on the promise of healing. I've been standing on the promise of this. I've been, I've been, I've been. And I just take them right to this verse and I say, well, here's your problem. The promise wasn't made to you. It was made to the seed. Christ. Now, this is important that you get this right now. I said, then they look at me and they say, well, are you saying I'm disqualified? No, not at all. But what you have to do is understand that it's not about you. It was about him. See what I'm saying? All the promises were made to him. They weren't made to you. Think about that for a minute. This is good. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. Because if they're made to you and me... The moment we don't experience it, we, we lapse right back into the law and judgment of ourselves. Isn't that right? But they're made to Him, the seed. And so we find in Corinthians, what? All the promises of God are yes and amen in Him. Right? Same thing He's talking about here. So He says here, brethren... Uh, wait a minute, where did I go? Oh, there I am. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So all the promises were made to the seed who is Christ. All right. Now I'm going to jump over a whole lot of verses here, and I want to go down to 
verse uh, 26, For you are all sons of God. This version says through faith in Christ Jesus, but we know it's through the faith of Christ Jesus or through the faith that is in Christ Jesus. The, The faith that was in Him. You know what I'm saying? Not your faith in Him, but the faith that is in Him. Okay? So this goes right along with man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. But here we go. So it says, "For, for you are all sons of God through the faith of Jesus, of Christ Jesus. And then it says this, and, and of course, because the translators have all been looking for exclusion, every exclusionary possibility they can find in Scripture for the us and them concept. This says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But, you know, and I'm sure several of you know this, but that that passage right there is all equally and properly transmitted for as much as you. Not for as many, but for as much. You hear what I'm saying? For as much as. This is the same word that is used. Let me just read this to you real quick over in Romans. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. You'll be familiar with it. In Romans 6, 3, it says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? As many of us as were. Now, see, what have we, what have we been hearing over and over and over and over again? One died for all and all died. All right? So this really what this, this should say in your understanding is, Do you not know that for as much as we were, for as much as we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death? For as much as we were. Get that? You got to write that down because it really helps. Otherwise, there's contradiction in the fact that we died with him, we were buried with him, we were made alive with him, we raised with him, and seated with him. Somewhere, I think Andre, I can't remember who said it, you know, somewhere along the line, oh, I think you said it, we got off in, in, in modern day presentation of the gospel. Where did we get off? Where did we choose to get off? We were buried with him. Crucified with him, buried with him. Well, I was crucified with him, but I I never quite made it to the tomb. Well, I was in the tomb, but when the call came by the Spirit of God to make him alive, uh, I didn't hear it. Or I came out, I was made alive, you know, I was raised, but when he left, I stayed here. I mean, where did we get off? See, and and so there's there's a there's a communication issue. It said, okay, let's, but let's go back over. That's the same, same communication there. You can check that out for you. But anyway, so in verse 27 says, for he's already said in verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus or through the faith of Jesus Christ, right? And then it says then in verse 27, uh, I'm going to write my own version too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, for as much as you were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Okay. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all, what? One in Christ Jesus. Now just let me get these three things out of these three verses. You are all sons of God, right? Got that one? You are all sons of God through the faith of Christ Jesus. Verse 27, the last few words say, you have put on Christ, right? Verse 28 says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, just keep that general theme in mind. Now, go with me to verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's, what? Seed, singular, as he said in verse 16, right? And heirs, plural. See, everybody gets the benefit of the identity of Christ, right? Okay? You're all seed, singular, and heirs, plural, of the problem. Now, look at this now. Now, look at your Bible carefully. Not the mirror. This won't work in the mirror, probably. (laughs) But look at the the way it's written. It's King James, New King James, New New American Standard. All the ones I checked out were the same. All right, so we read this. And if you are Christ's, C-H-R-I-S-T apostrophe S. Now, let me ask you something. In Paul's mind, in his communication, is that possessive or plural? Now, think about it. That's why I read you these things. You see, the translators have made it possessive. Right? You see that? It's possessive right there. Apostrophe S makes it possessive. 
Now, am I, am I disputing that we are not our own, we're bought with a price? No, I'm not at all that. I, I'm, I'm not, we, we are his possession. I'm not denying that at all. But in the context where he started out saying, identifying us with the seed, and then he said, you're all sons of God. You've all put on Christ. You're all one with Christ. Now he said, if you be Christ's, plural. He's preaching to the church at Galatia, and he says, if you be a Christ, and 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 you be a Christ, see that? He's, he's making a plural statement. In other words, if you have identified yourself as Christ by Christ, now this, wait, look, this is just a chapter after he said, it's no longer I who live. But Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, right? You see what I'm talking about here? It's important that we get this. This is not just a possessive thing. This, you're not just his possession. Now, I, and, I, and I said, now we know that passage of Scripture. Let me pass over there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19. I'm going to start in 19 because, again, <laughs> even though I've already conceded that we are his possession, but I want you to understand, who, who was it? Was it uh, Andre that stood up here and talked about how the Greek just goes on and 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 on. And we felt like it was necessary to put numbers and, and, and capitals and, and, and lowercase and, and, and punctuation, and it ain't there. Isn't that right? It ain't there. So we have to decide, according to our religious bent, what goes where. Isn't that right? And as he also said, you know, there are more versions or more original manuscripts than there are, would you say, letters in the Bible or something? Or, I mean, see, so, so we, we have to realize that the religious bent of the trans, translational system of the moment, I mean, we've got, we've got modern Bibles that have just been translated in our generation, and, of course, they, uh, they all reflect the translation. I mean, the mirror does. You see, but the mirror is a result of a revelation that has finally been allowed to develop in the earth of the truth. Now, as I said the other day when I opened up, I preach everything I can out of whatever Bible that most people in my congregation are using strictly because I really want them to see that what they're picking up in the message in the mirror and, and, and they're hearing from these is, is all right here too. It's just a matter of discovering it, digging out from underneath all of the religious garbage that's been tossed on top of it. So here we have a statement that in Galatians we did, and we're over in 1 Corinthians now. Here we have a statement that we need to make. I mean, I can, I can tell you confidently, you need to make a change. If you're using a, a, a Bible that you can write in, I know most of you have your Bible right there in the little pad now, so you can't make any changes. But if you can find a delete button, get that thing out of there. No, you, know, you need to get a typeover Bible put in your thing. You know. But if you, you really should go in, and, and I, all the people in my church have marked that apostrophe out of there. Because they, I want them to understand when they get there, that's a plural statement, not a possessive statement. You are Christ's. You are the seed, see, and therefore you are heirs. If you aren't the seed, you're not an heir, right? If you're not the seed, you're not an heir. You have no claim to the inheritance if you're not the seed. That's what I'm trying to communicate. And the seed is only Christ. And he said, if you be Christ's, plural, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs. All right. Amen. Thank you. The big amen. That's my brother that will give it to me any time. All right, in 1 Corinthians 6, though, let's read it this way, too. Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Okay, listen. Do you not know that your body... Now, look, at, look who occupies the body, okay? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not yourself. You're not yourself. Now, this is the same Paul that just told us we were Christ's over in Galatians. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advising you to go downtown West Monroe and start telling people this on the street. You might end up locked up somewhere. 
But you sure need to know it. You sure need to have a revelation of it. You know, this has made such a difference in our life. I mean, you know, Marilyn and I have had the blessing of, of understanding some things about our identity that, that has allowed that identity to produce itself in us, not in fullness, not in perfection by any stretch of the imagination, but we really haven't been sick in 40 years. Not because we're believing God for healing, because we're just believing in who we are, in, from within, from that fixed position within. And we, when I do talk about believing in Jesus, I'm not talking about believing things about Jesus. I'm talking about believing from within my fixed position within Him. See, that's what in means. It's a fixed position. Is it E-N in the Greek or whatever? I can't remember. But anyway, you know, I, I don't have that, all that stuff. I can give you the numbers out of the Strong's. So I can't just quote these Greek words and speak them like he does and these guys do. But, but, you know, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, this whole concept, he that believeth in me, right? He that believeth in me. Well, we thought that we were, that that, that meant, and so we've called ourselves followers of Christ. He didn't say he that followeth me. Or we've talked about being with him as though with him indicated an arm-in-arm relationship. See what I'm saying? But he didn't ask us really to do any of those things. He asked us to believe from within a fixed position within him. All right? Okay? He asked us to quit going by Abram and start going by Abraham, in other words. Okay? So he says, Do you not know that your own body, that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not yourself? For your body to price, therefore, therefore, glorify or magnify God. Make God bigger in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, here we go again. Is that plural or possessive? I said ye are God's, and all of you are sons of the Most High. And the Scripture cannot be broken. Psalm 82, 6, Jesus re- repeated it in John 10 and 24. Or 34, somewhere like that. Isn't that right? So, is this, <laughs> is this plural or is this possessive? I believe it's plural once again. I believe the revelation that Paul had was so strong that he was, that he was communicating to these people that ye are gods. I like that thing Caleb said yesterday about, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he, be, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And the fact that you can introduce into that this other thing, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you see, that though he was deity, he became humanity, that you through his humanity might be restored to your deity. Or to the revelation that we are the image and likeness of God. I mean, you know what? It doesn't make me the, all, the sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, all those words that we're not to identify ourselves by anyway, but <laughs> I learned that this week. I learned something this week. <laughs> I've learned a lot this week. I've been so blessed. But anyway, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm making that kind of a claim. It's, it's like, you know, I'm the same kind of being. I can still remember. They were just introducing uh, evolution in the Colorado school system when I hit seventh grade back in about 1950s, I don't know, something or other. Can't remember back that far anymore. And I was in one of the first classes where they were teaching it in the Jefferson County school system where I grew up in Arvada, Colorado. And I remember Mrs. Poulton, the teacher who was responsible for teaching, telling us that we were the highest form of the animal kingdom. That's what evolution was communicating, that humanity is the highest form of the animal kingdom, right? And I didn't know back then. So I identified with that for a while, and that's exactly what Romans chapter 1 says that they did. They started identifying with, with animals, with the beasts, with the, with, 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 with the animal kingdom, rather than their God kingdom. They lost their God connection, see? That they were the offspring of God, the very thing uh, for, uh, Francisco's, Francisco... Francois, he's just sitting over there two down from, from Sabrina. <laughs> it's Sabrina and another person in Francisco there. <laughs> Shut up, Bert. <laughs> but here, when we look at these things, when we hear these things, and I sit, tell you, you know, the, the Paul was saying, if you be Christ, if you have the revelation that you are Christ, right, 
And if you have the revelation, and as he goes on and says here, the magnify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, what's he saying? Magnify the God in you. Magnify yourself to be God's once again in the proper sense, with the proper revelation and understanding. Realize that once again you have been raised up and restored to that full, you know, unbroken, no distance, no whatever all these other guys said. You know, that's cool stuff. You know, all the distance removed, all of those things removed. Full restitution to your, re- to your position in God. Isn't that something? Yeah. All right. So that's not your doing. That's His doing. Isn't that right? Now, I want you to go with me over to, uh, again, I, I know that we can stand up here and quote these, but I want you to see them. Let, go to 1 Corinthians 1.30. <clears throat> And we know this, but of Him, of whom? Of the Father, of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Alright? He became for us righteousness, or 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him. Alright, so here's what we need to understand. So, we'll just use righteousness right now. You can... But, but I just want to, I'm going to use that since that's the first thing here. All right, so righteousness is what? God made, right? For I have made. Righteousness is God made. It's not you made, not me made, it's God made. Right? Righteousness was God made. We had nothing to do with it. God made it. Okay? All right. Now, what, what did he say to Abram? You shall be, for I have made. Right? Okay. Now, go with me over to Philippians chapter 1. Verse 11 says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So, now here we see that the fruit of what God made, righteousness was God made, and now we see that the fruit of what God made is in us by Christ Jesus, right? It's in us by what Jesus has done. So the fruit is in us. It's already indwelling, isn't that right? So right now what we've got is we've got... You know, the for I have made part of Abraham's promise back there. You shall be, for I have made. We've got the I have made. He made, and the fruit was in. You know, see, the life was coming back into Abram's seed, into, into Sarah's womb, the ability to, you know, that, that was all coming by God's hand. I mean, what could she have done? She couldn't go to the gynecologist and get some shots to restore that. He couldn't do anything. It was God made. Everything was God made, wasn't it? And the fruit was in him by he said, my, as for me, my covenant is with you. So the fruit was in Abraham by, his, by the work of God's covenant. Now, right? Now, if we go over to James chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, What's that mean? The fruit of righteousness. Okay, righteousness is God made. The fruit of that righteousness is in you by Christ Jesus, but it has to be sown, right? You shall be, for I have made. So now the you shall be is a matter of you just simply what? Beginning to declare who you really are. You're never going to change your opinion of yourself as long as you've got an opinion that's been formulated for you by your mother, by your father, by religion, by your attitude, by your behavior, by your time in prison, by anything else you've ever done. See? But it's true. Remember I talked about the amnesiac. He's who he is whether he knows it or not. Regardless of his perceived reality, an amnesiac is who he is. All right? And you are who you are whether you believe it or not. We've all been who we are, whether we believe, we've all been who He is, whether we believe it or not. I was who He is before I ever acknowledged Jesus Christ in my youth. I was already who He is. I was already the truth. Wasn't anything I could do to change it, but there was a lot I could do to not experience it and enjoy the benefit of it. See what I'm saying? So the fruit, the righteousness is God made. The fruit of righteousness is in me. Or let's put it this way. My identity is God made. The fruit of that identity, I'm an heir, according, you know, the fruit of that is in me by Jesus Christ, and it is sown. 
by them who, so now who's he? He's brought me on the scene to begin to declare it. Not to make it be. Like, like, he, like Bernie's been talking about, I'm not declaring something to make it come to pass. I'm declaring who it already, who, what, what's already happened, what's already taken place, what's already true. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. And if I don't talk about it, you know, I love it. when I, I still go back, even though it was misused in my early days of Word of Faith back in the 70s. You know, <clears throat> I love to go back to, to, to God's inter- exchange with Joshua. You know, this word shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it day and night. And then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Well, what's meditation? I mean, muttering. I mean, that's the whole concept of reminding yourself what the Word says about you. When Marilyn and I first began to believe, our daughter was miraculously healed in 1975 uh, in Childress, Texas, and I was, you know, about... You know, about that far from alcoholism, and I didn't really, you know, there was nothing in my life that displayed any religious right for me to believe that Michelle would be healed. But she was healed when the Lord spoke to me in a, in a, in a grocery store there and said, if you'll go out to the van and pray for that little girl who was in the process of dying, what? Oh, no, my time's not up. I, 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 I'm going to sing a song like Francois did when I'm done. Where's the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> I'm about done. But anyway, she was healed, and the Lord spoke to me and said, if you go out to the van and pray for that little girl, I'll heal her, see? And, and you know, we began to, you know, start trusting the Lord in the, in the, in the realm of healing. I wish you hadn't interrupted me, darling, because now I forgot what I was going to say, and I know it was something important. If everything that comes out of my mouth is important. <laughs> oh, 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 I know what it's going to be. You know, and, and so we began to encounter people, now, now, was it true that before 1975 that by his stripes she was healed? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it was true, wasn't it? So, and and that, was all, that was all the work of the Father through the Lord Jesus, right? So our health was God-made. Yes. And, 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 it was, and it was actually residing in all of us by Jesus Christ, even before we acknowledged it. But on that day, we had an experience, an enlightened experience at that moment that produced... But you see, that moment did not change our life. It did. It set a new direction in our life. But what happened, the the change came into our life when we began to sow into our hearing, into our exchange with one another when our children would come down with fevers and when things would happen, when we began to declare what was already true. Now, Word of Faith tried to convince me that it was my declaration that was going to make it happen. So it took me a little while to get my, you know, and so we went two or three years. Every time the kids got sick, we'd lay hands on them, we'd pray for them, and we'd quote Scripture over them, you know, and because that was the formula we were offered, and we just wanted our children well, and we had enough sense to realize that God wanted them well, you know, and the mercy of God was abundant to us. But then the time came when we began to realize that Jesus didn't die on the cross for our children to be healed. He died on our cross. For our, for, died on the cross. I mean, not just for you know. But I'm saying he didn't. He didn't die expecting that they would need healing over and over and over again. He died on the cross to produce health along with the whole new, newness of life. And so we began to make declarations, new declarations, based on this understanding now that he'd already done it. wasn't about anything we could do to produce it. He'd already done it. But we began to sow it. And so we looked at our. We talked to one another. We said, you know what? Sickness and disease are not going to have any more part in this house because Jesus destroyed it on the cross. And it took about a year and a half of wrestling with, because we had six kids, you know. Well, we didn't didn't have six at the time when that, we had five. Caleb wasn't born yet at that time. But, 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 but we had these five children. And, you know, snotty noses, the opportunities for mumps, strep, different things like that. One boy was born with a lazy eye that was going to require surgical correction. You know, we just saw these things. Our daughter broke her arm running to school one day, the other daughter. You know, and was healed in an hour and a half after we prayed. But, but we said, no more. And after about a year and a half, two years, our kids quit being sick, and our kids weren't sick anymore growing up in our home. But it was because we sowed what we knew to be true and began to declare it over our children and over in our home. See what I'm saying? And I have no expectation of sickness and disease. Does that mean I've never been tempted? Yes, I've been tempted. I was tempted a month ago with a kidney stone. And I went and preached both the messages that I was supposed to preach while my body was trying to pass, process a kidney stone. I've had a few opportunities to give in and say, I'm sick, let's go, you know. But he said in Isaiah, in this day we're not to say we're sick. Not because it's a bad confession, because we wouldn't need to, because of what he took care of. Yes. See what I'm saying? Yes. And so, you know, where the face said, don't say it, it's a bad confession. Like hocus pocus, you'll bring it on you if you say it, right? 
But yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bertie. There's that thing again. <laughs> she brought it up. I did that. She brought it up. S- Sabrina did. <laughs> anyway. But here's the thing. As I said, you're only going to be able, I just want to use this, you know, in conclusion. Say you're only going to be able to, you're only going to begin to identify with your identity by declaring it to yourself. And, and, and I declared it, in, you know, I would declare it in the face of anybody that tried to, call, to tell me different. I'm not going to just run down the street and say, I'm Christ, I'm Christ, I'm Christ, I'm Christ. In this day and age, you probably gather quite a following. I'd probably open up a camp out here somewhere. <laughs> but anyway... But the caretakers, here's the thing, the caretakers have been speaking to us all week long. We've been hearing this this message all week long. The caretakers have been showing us pictures from, you know, letters from the Scripture. They've been showing us pictures of 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 our heavenly family. You know what I'm saying? So the caretakers have been speaking all this week. And so your response, you know, needs to be, uh uh-huh, and you need to begin to declare it. You need to begin to talk about it and not let it, not let it escape you when you leave here. See? Don't, don't be believing God for things. Be believing huh, who you are in Him because of what He has done to you. See, the believing what He's done for you is good, except that when you start believing for it yourself, but if you understand He's already done it to you, then the for you becomes almost an irrelevant consideration. Isn't that right? <clears throat> so we've got those, you know, and we, we've got plenty of... Uh, honey, come on up here with that reading you've got. Will you please? You sure? y- yes, it's not going to take that long. They don't care. Yeah. No, they're fine. We're all... No, we're all... But so we, we've got all kinds of evidence of Paul, you know, constantly declaring, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. John tells us as we are, as he is, so also are we. Isn't that right? <clears throat> 